One of my gaming highlights in 2018 was the release of the SNK 40th Anniversary Collection on the Nintendo Switch. Offering a curated journey through the company's pre-Neo Geo days, highlighting lesser known titles, their soundtracks, alongside a museum profiling all of the releases in that time period, it's a strongly recommended title for those interested in gaming history. As I sat down to play the various games included, I couldn't help but ask myself, how many of these got converted to home computer platforms? And more importantly, were any of them actually any good? So I'm going to kick off a little mini series here in which I'm going to try and cover off as many official computer conversions as I can of games in the pack. So let's dive in. This is Beyond the Scan Lines. The obvious starting point is with 1985's Tank, or TNK3 for those in the US. It's a great opener for two reasons. Firstly, it was considered a last shot release. Had it bombed, we'd certainly not be able to celebrate the legacy of SNK. That is for certain. Secondly though, it was the first game to introduce the loop lever, an eight-way directional joystick with a rotating stick allowing you to both move your character and change its facing direction all from a single input. Now for the game itself, Tank has you dropped onto a beach inside your trusty tank, where you're going to be tasked with fighting your way through enemy defences to tackle another nameless dictator. Your tank is equipped with a machine gun alongside its main cannon. The former always fires in the direction you're facing, and the latter is controlled independently by rotating the joystick. Ocean picked up the license and released conversions for the big three 8-bits in 1987 with conversion duties given to Choice Software. This C64 version looks solid from its first impressions. There's a nice version of the arcade game's title tune, and the scrolling is smooth enough. It's the controls where things get a little unstuck though, particularly how they've worked around the arcade game's control scheme. To start with, you have two modes on offer, separate and combined. The former allows you to rotate and fire the turret using the keyboard, acting like the arcade machine, whilst the joystick controls your tank and firing its machine guns. Combined is a more traditional scheme, which keeps the tank's turret locked to the direction you're moving in. You will still need to fire the turret separately though. Separate mode can be quite a fiddly experience when using both the joystick and keyboard. Thankfully though, tank is a slower paced game, so this isn't too much of a problem and you might actually feel comfortable with it. I personally didn't, and thankfully, if you wish, you can actually play the entire game from the keyboard, and that does work a fair bit better, at least in my experience. There is one niggle I've got with the actual game controls though. Whilst you can rotate the cannon in any of the eight cardinal directions, you can only move in the core four, which really puts you at a bit of a disadvantage should you choose the combined mode, because you can't shoot in any of those diagonal directions. But the CC4 version is fairly solid. Now onto the Spectrum version, and it's a bit of a mixed bag in my eyes. On the upside, the diagonal movement controls actually work when using the joystick. But like the CC4 version, I think it's really worth playing this on the keyboard, especially in the separated control option. Now, one weird little quirk is that the rotation controls for the turret are actually reversed. You've got to get your mind around it when you're rebinding your keys from the title screen. It should be said though, it did take a few tries before I instinctively unwound the idea of binding the keys the opposite way and got used to it. So I guess you can as well. On the visual front, the Spectrum's developers have done well in avoiding excessive color clash. And everything, other tanks, soldiers, power-ups, all are quite distinct as you play. So there's no risk you're gonna run into something that you're not really prepared for. This does come with one big trade-off though, and that's the speed. As the game is both somewhat more sluggish and a little rougher in how it scrolls. Now, uh, truthfully, the latter isn't really a surprise on the Spectrum. It is the Spectrum after all, but it's a bit of a shame that the pacing is off in comparison to the C64 version. Now, like I said earlier, Tank isn't really the kind of intense rush that other shooters are, so you can actually live with it and perhaps, you may grow to appreciate it over the speed of the original arcade game. Sound is also a little lacking here. The in-game effects, 
are simplistic. Whether you're listening to them through the beeper on the 48K models or the AY chip on the 128K machines. The title tune though is a different story. There's a nice cover of the arcade games theme for the 128K machines, while on the 48 it actually plays a completely different piece. Don't know why, but it does. While both the C64 and Spectrum versions of Tank don't really compare to the arcade original, especially for that craving of tank battling action, in their own ways though, I think they're both solid enough, and I don't think you'll truly be disappointed if you were to sit down with either. Though personally, the C64 version is the one which stands tall of the two for me, you can't really go wrong with either one, providing you know you're not expecting arcade perfection. Next up, we've got the game featuring the most well-known of SNK's characters, Athena. Coming out in 1986, this one has you taking charge of the heroine as she takes on various fantasy realms, collecting pieces of equipment to boost her fighting capability. I'm not going to lie, this is one I just couldn't really get into. As the nature of the gameplay, mostly dominated by bashing blocks in trying to get upgrades, whilst avoiding enemy attacks ad infinitum, just was not engaging to me at all. So onto the home versions. Once again, Ocean had picked up the license for this, choosing to release it under their Imagine label in 1987. Unlike many of the other games I'm checking out in this video, both the C64 and Spectrum versions were handled by in-house staffers. In theory, this should make for a better title, right? especially when compared to some of the teams which Ocean had contracted out work to in the past. But sadly, this isn't the case at all. On a purely mechanical front, Athena certainly lives up to the arcade machine, with the C64 version being just as plotting with how she moves about the levels, bashing bricks and collecting weapons and armour. My biggest pain point was really experiencing just how ineffective her attack, particularly the starting kick is. With such a restricted range, battling enemies is likely to cost you health, especially as those you encounter early on can do some serious damage and you can have to fight a fair few of them before you're likely able to get your first upgraded weapon. By the time I did that, I found I regularly had lost almost half my health bar. And when you die, you reset back to the start of the stage, so you gotta do it all over again. This makes it seriously infuriating to play. And then you get to the visuals. Artistically, the background graphics, they do the job. They're colourful, scroll well, and do a great job of showing what the C64 can do with the cartoonish tone of the arcade game. The same cannot be said for the sprites. Sure, they move smooth, they're responsive, there's no multiplexer flicker or sprite bugs visible on screen, but there's no colour to them. All the sprites use the C64's high resolution sprite mode, allowing for a single colour per sprite. And whilst that normally means you can use any colour per sprite, here they all use the same colour, white. Perhaps there was a technical limitation here, maybe there wasn't memory or CPU time to manage all the resources, and whilst it means it's all visually distinct, which can be lost in a lot of other games, it kind of undersells the poor C64 quite a bit. This also extends to the audio, which was certainly subject to the same memory restrictions as whilst having Martin Galway produce a killer soundtrack was one of those little tricks Ocean used to save a pretty bad game, here he was only given the bare minimum room to cover all the required music and sound effects. So unsurprisingly, the Spectrum version suffers just as much as this C64 version did simply just not being a good conversion. Visually, to no surprise, they've gone for purely monochromatic game here. As for the audio, it's pretty much the standard Spectrum 48K beeper. There is no 128K AY chip support here. In fact, even though the game says there's a 128K version, all it really does is offer the facility to load all the levels in at once. And considering the challenge, I'm not sure you really want to sit through that 10 minute load time. But again, the true pain lies in the mechanics. Like the C64 version, your starting kick attack is woefully ineffective. Very little attack range, and once again, you're likely to take a lot of damage in trying to get your first weapon. 
but even when you have upgraded somewhat, it still feels like you're ineffective in battle. And I don't know about you, but for me, in an action game, if your attack capabilities are that useless, it really doesn't make for engaging action. I certainly didn't enjoy Athena's arcade version, and I kind of was not expecting much from either the CCD4 or Spectrum ports. And honestly, it's no surprise to say that they didn't even live up to that standard which I was expecting. Both make for two very dull takes on a not very well regarded arcade game, totally making it a miss in my book. Now we're on to Athena's second adventure. Well, more her distant descendants adventure with 1986's Psycho Soldier. Other than the mechanic of obtaining power-ups by smashing rocks, it's quite a different style of game. One where you're jumping between platforms in an auto-scrolling, almost shmup-like experience. This time, blasting the walls releases bombs which serve as your special attacks, and also energy which makes those attacks more powerful. Then there's the ability to temporarily shift into a flying beast to do way more damage. But there's also pickups which drain your powers, so you really need to learn the levels and engage in a bit of tactical play to make sure you know which are and aren't safe to collect. No surprise to see that Ocean licensed the rights, again putting it out on the Imagine label in 1987. Again, being released on the big 3 8 bits. Whilst Athena was handled in house, the conversions for Psycho Soldier were farmed out to Source. And onto the CCD4 we go. And don't know about you, but the first impressions aren't that bad. Not necessarily great, but they're okay. Once we get into the game, there's a good enough rendition of the arcade game's title music. Thankfully better, because the cheesy lyrics aren't there. The visuals are colourful and clear, for the most part anyway, because I didn't really find myself having difficulty spotting enemies or the pickups. Well, mostly. The icons for some of the power-ups tended to be a little tough to distinguish sometimes, especially those which drained your energy. And so it can be a bit frustrating, especially because you just can't go for every single power-up which appears, at least until you recognise the patterns. Whilst the arcade game distinguished these by the colour, the CZ4 and its limitations means it's not really possible, so you get the confusion as a result. The bigger pain though was collision detections, particularly between your shots and the enemies because sometimes it feels like that your blasts need to actually travel some way across the screen, even if it's only a little bit, before they can register collisions with enemies. So when you're trying to attack an enemy who's gotten a little too close to you, it would frequently not register and mean that you'd lose a life without not much of a chance to retaliate. As with its predecessor, the Spectrum version of Psycho Soldier supports both 128 and 48k Spectrums, with the version for the 128k machines really only loading all levels in at once. Once again, audio is only handled by the beeper. Whilst I didn't mind the SID's take on the arcade game music, its omission here is not something I can be truly disappointed about. I mean, it wouldn't sound great in the 48k beeper anyway, and it's no surprise that it doesn't have 128k audio support. The bigger change with the Spectrum version now is really about the level design. Levels are far more compact here, only offering three platform levels instead of four. Now this is one of those moves which can be a blessing and a curse. On one hand, it means there's more space for the power-ups to be better defined. Whilst the Spectrum version is monochromatic, the higher resolution does mean they're clearer, and you can even distinguish those ones which are hazardous to you against those which are actually beneficial. But at the same time, it reduces the free space you have in each stage. And there's plenty of moments where you're already fighting the auto-scrolling system that you can really get trapped and only have one way to go due to the level design. The levels have been redesigned and they are much worse here. So Psycho Soldier is, in a way, a bit of an odd game. There are absolutely better shooters out there, but despite that, I had fun with it. I liked the arcade version and I liked the C64 version. I don't think I'm going to revisit either of them over and over, but it, it's a serviceable conversion of an okay game. Now on the other hand, I can't really rate the Spectrum version all that much. 
whilst it's clearer for the pickups. The rest of it is just a little too limited for my liking and the level design suffers way too much from the changes they've made. Next, we're on to Time Soldiers, originally released into arcades in 1997. You're tasked with rescuing your comrades who have been scattered across time by the villainous Guyland. Each is located in one of the game's five time periods. The Primitive Age, the Age of Rome, the Age of Wars, the World Wars, and finally, the Future World. What makes Time Soldiers unique is that you need to tackle these in a non-linear fashion. You'll start in one period, and need to locate the time gates in order to move to the next. Eventually, you'll reach the time period where your comrade is. Once you defeat the boss guardian, they'll be freed and you can go on to hunt down the next one. Now for the home versions. Time Soldiers was licensed to Electrocoin and released in 1989 for the C64, Amiga and Atari ST. But it was known as Time Soldier and handled by Smart Egg Software. The first thing with the C64 version is just how the time periods are handled. For those who have the opportunity to play the disc release, it plays just like the arcade. You'll encounter time gates to move between periods. On the tape version though, it's a far more linear progression. You'll work your way through each period in sequence, staying in that one until you rescue your given colleague. The presentation is solid though, offering options for one or two players, though not simultaneously like the arcade game, alongside some great title music and a nice little introductory piece played as you walk into a new time zone. The real big change is with the controls. Unsurprisingly, Time Soldiers in the Arcade is another game controlled by the loop lever joystick. So, on the C64 here, the controls are dramatically simplified. You have 8-way movement, but you'll always face in the direction you're moving, and firing only allows you to shoot your current weapon, whether that's your starting blaster, or the last weapon you picked up. Now this is an important change because quite frankly, your primary weapon is horrible. Its short range and lack of actual damage, meaning enemies take several hits before dying, means finding a pickup to upgrade is an important priority, especially as power-ups stack. You can upgrade a given weapon two more times from additional pickups, making them far more effective in action. There is a flow and effect from this. When you die, in the arcade game, you would lose your weapon and it'd be back to your main blaster. Here on the C64, you actually retain your current weapon. Type Soldier is a brutal game, and retaining your weapon upon death gives you that slight fighting chance when moving on to your next life, which helps just that little bit in order to avoid frustration. Visuals really do a good job on the C64, though there's some points where the bullets clashed a little too much with the backgrounds particularly when fighting the main boss of the primitive age, where they almost blend into the grass. The scrolling though is a bit of a different story. It doesn't really scroll smoothly, but it's more that auto push type of movement, where you'll move and it takes an age to catch up. So it also means reacting to some enemies can be painful because you can't freely move about, because you'll accidentally trigger more as a result. Now for the 16-bit version as well the Amiga version at least. Like the C64 counterpart, the controls have been simplified to work rather well with a 8-way movement and 5 button to shoot your current weapon. Unlike the C64 version, it's only playable by a single player. There isn't an alternating two-player mode available. Visually, the game looks quite detailed. It's very reminiscent of the arcade original, though the colors aren't quite as rich. The scrolling model of the C64 version is also retained here. And sadly, it's just as much of a pain as a result. The element that really I don't like with this Amiga version is the changes to your lives. Instead of the standard three lives offered by the arcade and C64 versions, here you've only got one life. Now, this is replaced by a reasonably long energy bar, and yes, it probably means you can take far more hits, but it doesn't do a great job of warning you when you're critically low, which means you may not necessarily be prepared when your energy is low, and so be surprised when you get hit, killed, and get in the game unexpectedly. Out of all the games featured in this video so far, I think Time Soldier is the most interesting of them. 
the drastic differences made to accommodate the home versions certainly make it far more playable than a straightforward conversion of the arcade machine. But at the same time, these offer quite a few frustrations in their own right. I think it's worth checking out, but your mileage might vary depending on how frustrated you get with this kind of action game. And now we come to the final game for this part, Guerrilla War from 1987. This one has you, and optionally a friend, take on a mission to battle your way through and liberate the people from an oppressive dictator. Now, if you're wondering why that sounds a little kind of generic compared to some of the other plots in games we've featured, well, let's say the story in its Japanese release was far more controversial, and leave it at that. Mechanically, Guerrilla War could be considered a beefed up Akari Warriors, offering similar run and gun action, though with larger sprites necessitating a multi directionally scrolling playfield, alongside the ability to rescue hostages for bonus points, plus the alternate weapons. So, for the home conversions, Guerrilla War is once again back in the hands of Ocean, being published on the Imagine label in 1988, with development duties handled by the team at Sentient Software. Opening impressions are not great here with the C64 version. The menu feels pretty lifeless, and the only positive thing is Jonathan Dunn's music. You've got plenty of options though, one or two players, the latter being simultaneous. Now for controls, options exist for both joystick and keyboard control, though you will have to set these every time you start a game. You've also got the ability to play it like a traditional shooter, in effect the combined mode out of tank, or to emulate the loop lever controls. Now, whilst that can work in other games, like Tank, getting it to work with two players on a C64 wrangling over the keyboard might just be a little too much. Especially if one of those players has to use the keyboard for movement as well. It's even worse because you can't redefine the keys and you're lumped with what the game set. Thank heavens the C64 has two joystick buttons. But onto the game itself, and oh boy, this this one is really a mess. Whilst it's admirable the developers will try to emulate the arcade's visual style with its larger sprites, the results are kind of horrendous. The horizontal screen layout combined with giant sprites means you don't get a lot of room ahead of you, so it's easy to be surprised by enemy choke points. Now, I alluded to it a bit earlier, but if there's something positive here, it really is the music. It's great to listen to, providing a great background to your mission but it's a bit of a shame that it's just lumped in with this game. So very much. On the Spectrum side of the fence, things start up very much like the 64 version. A similar menu, but obviously way more joystick options. And those running a 128K Spectrum will also get an AY version of Jonathan Dunn's title music. Another nice little addition to have. Now, when we get into the game itself, Color Clash isn't much of an issue, thanks to the um, rigid layout of the levels working along lines of the Spectrum's attributes. While the CCD4 version had a landscape layout which offered very little visibility ahead of the players, the screen setup for the Spectrum offers a more portrait style one which helps somewhat with the visibility and lessens the chance, somewhat, of running blind into enemy choke points. But then you have the texturing of the ground, and that means details could be easily lost amongst the noise. So, you could still be surprised by enemies, especially when they're amongst those tree sections that you can't easily get to. It should not be a surprise for me to say that the Spectrum version happens to suffer from the exact same control problems here. Having to flip between the joystick and keyboard if you want to rotate can still be cumbersome especially when you can't redefine keys, and you probably have to share the keyboard with the second player because you're typically running on a Spectrum that only has a single joystick port, unless you are very lucky to have one of the hot off the presses plus two or plus three machines. But then things get to a really bad point. There was a point where I got stuck amongst some fences. I was stuck in a very little area of the map, and there wasn't enough room for my grenades to actually take out the obstacles around me meaning I couldn't proceed. Let's face it, both Guerrilla War on the C64 and Spectrum 
are horrible on so many levels. The visuals are ugly. The large sprites are nice, but they clash too much with the backgrounds. The tight play area means that you're corralled into enemy choke points on far too many occasions to be reasonable. All the controls. The game is really set up for that loop lever style rotate and move action. In normal mode, you are significantly disadvantaged because you can't move while facing certain directions. But when you use rotate mode, being that you can't redefine the keys to something more comfortable, it feels just as unwieldy there. There are too many controls to operate and it's just a mess. A pure mess. Especially given that the game is not a slow paced shooter like Tank, it's far more frantic and far more action packed. and the controls just get in the way of it being engaging. Well, on top of the game's many, many other problems. And so we come to the end of this first part. Now, one of the surprises in those I've covered for me was Tank. Whilst I found both the C64 and Spectrum computer ports satisfactory to play, the arcade game won me over for its pacing and engaging challenge. Time Soldiers was a bit of a surprise, and whilst I enjoyed the concept, I felt the arcade version was way too embedded in its secret mission to take all the coins to really have long-term staying power for me. Both the C64 and Amiga versions were easily the most impressive conversions of the games featured, and mostly fun to play, if not for some of the more frustrating design decisions they brought over in terms of the difficulty. Athena left me cold in many ways, so I wasn't expecting much from either the C64 or Spectrum conversions. It's a game which was too frustrating for its own good, with its ineffective attacks, tedious gameplay and quite a few other problems. Neither the C64 or Spectrum versions had any real redeemable factors in my eyes, with the tedium on both being turned all the way up to 11. Psycho Soldier was kind of unremarkable in many ways, but it was playable though, and one I could certainly sit down with in future. The C64 version shared that feeling, though if it wasn't for the ease of getting confused with some of the pickups due to the visual designs, it would have been a little better. As it stands, it's a little lesser than the arcade machine for that very reason. The Spectrum conversion though suffers far more from its altered level designs. It makes an experience which is both paced slower because of the hardware, but also less engaging because the levels just don't flow as well as they do in the arcade original. Then we have Guerrilla War. Whilst the arcade game is fun, though like Time Soldiers, a bit guilty of being a coin muncher, both these home computer ports to the C64 and Spectrum are, to put it simply, a terrible abomination. Clashing visuals. Restrictive gameplay, tight levels, all of these combine to create a tedious, punishing game which offers no redeeming qualities. Well, outside of the music at least. And here we are at the end of the first part of this mini-series. The second part is going to focus on the obvious bigger mission here, the Ikari Warriors trilogy. It felt like the natural way to split it up, especially considering how long this video has gone on for as it stands. So do check that out in a fortnight's time on the next Beyond the Scanlines. Well, it's been quite a journey so far. Don't know about you, but I always love discovering new titles that one hasn't played before and can really get into. I really can't wait to play Tank some more. So as always, if you've enjoyed the video, do consider hitting the thumbs up and thank you all very much for watching.